Hello and welcome to Per La Victoire. Today I'm excited to share with you how I made this chemise, perfect for the 1880s, 1890s, and early 1900s. This was a super easy and quick project using a free pattern online, and I hope it inspires you to make your own frilly, floofy Victorian or Edwardian underwear. A chemise was the first garment a woman put on, and it protected the corset and outer garments from sweat and body oils. It had to be frequently washed, comfortable, and breathable. You may be familiar with the fine extant garments covered in frilly lace and embroidery and ribbons. I love those pieces, but I wanted something a little bit more practical, something hard wearing that I could throw into the washing machine after a long day of wearing it, but that still had that dainty historical look and was appropriate for the 1890s as I've been sewing a lot of 1890s projects lately. I looked through pattern catalogs and fashion magazines of the 1880s, 1890s, and early 1900s and found that chemises fell into one of three general categories. The simplest style of chemise with a high neck and front button placket. Sometimes the neckline and placket are trimmed with lace, and these were usually the most affordable options sold as patterns or ready-to-wear garments. The square neck style featuring a yoke or insert of lace, embroidery, pin tucks, and or insertion. This style appears more common for the 1880s and 1890s. The gentle U-shape or V-shape curved neckline framed by lace or embroidery. The lace or embroidery often had a ribbon or drawstring run through it to help gather the neckline to fit. Scans of catalogs and pattern magazines are excellent resources because they have precise dates, unlike items in museum collections or online auctions, although those items are great for general inspiration and detailed photos. It's so interesting to me to see how some styles of chemise were popular for over 30 years. It really was a basic every person's garment available at all price points and in various styles of trimming and daintiness. I was particularly inspired by this antique chemise currently being sold on Etsy. I fell in love with the pin tucked yoke and if you've been on my channel for any amount of time you've probably seen that I will never shy away from making lots of tedious tiny pin tucks. Like the chemise illustrations in the magazines and catalogs, there was a binding or strip on the outside of the chemise that concealed where the lace had been attached. For the pattern, I used the drafting instructions in the Manual of Needlework and Cutting Out by Agnes Walker, published in 1907. Of the chemise pattern drafts I found in scans online, this was by far the easiest for me to follow. I found the grid really easy to work with and the measurements really clear. I think as drafted, this chemise pattern is intended for the style with a higher neckline and a center front button placket. But as I wasn't looking to make that style, I lowered the neckline to accommodate the beautiful pin tucked yoke and removed some width from the center front and center back and side seams since I'm a bit petite and I didn't need that extra volume. I also removed about two inches from the hem. I think this pattern could easily be scaled up to a larger size by just adding width at the center front slash center back or the side seams. It was a very easy, straightforward draft. For fabric, I used white cotton lawn from Dharma Trading Company that was in my stash left over from previous projects. It was pretty satisfying to use up those scraps to make this. This fabric is relatively inexpensive at about $7 a yard, is easily available online for people in the US, and has a wonderful, lightweight, almost sheer quality to it. I think it's perfect for late Victorian and Edwardian undergarments, and other things like caps, aprons, and even lingerie dresses. Instead of using a really delicate, fine French style or vintage lace, I decided to use a modern reproduction eyelet lace trim that I also had in my stash. I figured this would really take well to washing and my machine was a bit more hardy and in some of the examples of chemises I saw that were cheaper, it seemed like this embroidered trim was used instead of the really fine French laces. The chemise was really easy to put together. I first sewed up the side seams with a French seam and hemmed the chemise. I sewed the shoulders with a flat felt seam. And then it was time to work on all the details. I created the pin tucked yoke out of the trapezoidal piece of fabric cut out from the neckline when I was cutting out the chemise. The pin tucks are a quarter of an inch wide and half an inch apart. I cut a piece of eyelet one and a half times longer than the top of the yoke gathered it, and sewed it wrong sides together to the yoke. 
The exposed seam allowance was then covered by a one inch strip of bias cut from the cotton lawn. All the seam allowances were carefully trimmed and then the other long edge of the bias strip was folded down and top stitched by machine. And then finally, I decorated the bias strip with a double feather stitch embroidery. The original chemise had a single feather stitch embroidery, but because my bands ended up a bit wider than the original inspiration chemise, I did a double feather stitch to better take up the space. I used this vintage embroidery floss that I had in my stash. It's a pale peachy color. At first I was a little hesitant to have a contrast color with the embroidery, but it's actually not that noticeable and I think it's super cute. The double feather stitch was so easy to embroider. I'm not a skilled embroiderer by any means. I think I'm very much a beginner, but this one was really easy to do even without marking the fabric in any way. It was very easy to eyeball, so I spent a few evenings sitting on the couch, nice and cozy, doing the embroidery on this chemise. I highly recommend you give the feather stitch embroidery a try on your next Victorian or Edwardian undergarment project. I think commercially produced chemises like this at the time would have used a tape instead of bias strips, just because it would be much easier to manipulate. I even found that braid with the feather stitch embroidery on it was sold by retailers like H. O'Neill and R. H. Macy. I sewed small reinforcing stitches in the inner corners of the front neckline of the chemise and then clipped almost to the stitching. I sewed gathering threads along the front and back of the neckline and then I set in the yoke in the center front of the neckline wrong sides together, again leaving the seam allowances exposed. To finish off the armholes, I cut a length of the eyelet lace trim one and a half times longer than each armhole, plus a little bit for seam allowance, sewed them into a loop, flat fell the seam allowance, ran a gathering thread along the edge of the eyelet, and then sewed the eyelet trim onto the armholes, again, wrong sides together. Like the yoke, this exposed seam allowance was covered with a bias strip. I tried on the neckline to adjust the gathers of the center back. I ended up making them quite tight. I think an alternate treatment for this area would be to use small pin tucks along the back instead of gathers, but gathers are certainly easier here. To imitate the original chemise I was basing my design off of and a lot of the examples I saw in the pattern magazines and catalogs, for the neckline, my lace doesn't go all the way across the neckline, it stops at that front inner corner. So I measured a piece of lace that would go from that front inner corner all the way around the neckline to the other front inner corner. Again, one and a half times longer than that measurement. Gathered it lightly, sewed it wrong sides together, and then I covered that whole neckline seam with the bias. Finally, I embroidered the double feather stitch embroidery on these bias bands and my chemise was complete. The embroidery and stitching isn't perfect. There are some areas where I had a little bit of trouble navigating the bulk and gathers around the bias bands and where my embroidery was a little bit inconsistent, but I think that makes it look charming and homemade, and it is in fact homemade. It's not a mass manufactured product, so I don't think it's fair to hold it to that standard. All in all, I finished this project in about a week. It was super easy, pretty straightforward, and has that dainty, frilly, historical underwear look while being a bit more easy to maintain and easy to source the materials for than the more frilly, frothy counterparts. I'm so excited to wear this chemise with my historical garments or even when the weather is warm, maybe tucked into a skirt or underneath a dress. I think the pin tucked yoke and the gathered eyelet makes this chemise so special. I highly recommend that you give this project a try. I'll leave a link down below to the pattern book that I used and a few other resources that were helpful. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and comment down below and subscribe if you want to see more historical sewing videos. Thank you so much for watching.